All right, everyone, welcome back to Bigfoot's Wilderness. Our encounter story for today is called Backcountry Bigfoot. In 2009, after spending almost 30 years working in the logging industry on the West Coast, I decided it was time to come home. I credit my father for motivating me and teaching me a skill and something I truly enjoyed. I'm not married and have no children, so I just threw myself into my work. I love working outside. Showing my willingness and eagerness to learn, I got a reputation from my employers as being dependable, but most importantly, a hard worker. I also was given the opportunity to move around and work at other locations. I spent about a year working in Alaska and after that on to Washington State, where I spent several more years working at various locations before moving on to Oregon and then finally back to my home in Minnesota. Loggers, lumberjacks, whatever you want to call us, it's not for the faint of heart. I've met some interesting people, to put it mildly, and all of them are here for the same reason, money. And they too came to the same conclusion, the job is downright tough. You carry ice packs and bandages in your cooler. I've broken my leg, dislocated my shoulder twice, working on a hook tender, rolled and sprained both my ankles on separate occasions, encountered heat stroke more times than I can remember, and I've heard quite a few Bigfoot stories throughout the years that my fellow loggers have shared with me. All that time in the woods, I wasn't fortunate enough to have a sighting in the PNW, but I did on one occasion discover some prints. Three, actually. They reminded me of how someone would walk a tightrope a perfect line, and they were big, a wide naked foot that was bigger than my construction boots, and I wore a size 14. I almost think that a sighting is as rare as hitting the lottery, which may tell you something about their population, but I speak too soon. Let me explain. I've had an experience with Bigfoot in my home state, and I've always had mixed feelings, guilt being one of them, but I'll get to that in a minute. That couldn't be said for some of my co-workers. Pra practically all of the guys I worked with were much older than myself and pretty serious hunters. Not purely for sport, but more for necessity as putting food on the table for their families was a priority. Whenever we'd get together, they'd share stories about their weekend hunting trips. I wasn't much into hunting, but they knew I was waiting to hear about something else out there. One thing they weren't interested in was looking for Bigfoot, and I wasn't about to go out and look for it myself after what I experienced. I was just curious what their behavior was like and was taking down their accounts in an informal way. We spent a lot of time working together, and although I was several years younger, I'd earned their respect because I took my job serious and they could depend on me. Safety was paramount. They didn't make a big deal out of what they'd seen. Not being a native of the area, conversations about Bigfoot aren't as taboo as you might think in the Pacific Northwest. While I was in Anchorage, I became fast friends with an old Eskimo. He was full of stories about everything. Spirits, souls of the dead, even some of the living. Animals, and even spirit animals. He had a tale about everything. It was rather confusing, but he spinned a good yarn. The one story that stuck with me the most was one early morning when he was hunting elk. He'd followed a herd and was trying to glass them. Something was happening as the elk herd was clearly spooked. The herd was being chased by a pack of wolves coming up off a nearby ridge. A tall, dark figure was leading these wolves on the chase. It ran on two legs and easily kept up with the wolves' pace. Its body and limbs appeared large and long, and it towered over the pack. He said he saw it catch up to the fleeing herd and leap onto an unsuspecting cow. The elk's legs and body collapsed and buckled, causing a cloud of dust and dirt. He said he was so frightened by what he saw that he quickly reconsidered his need to hunt that day. The native name for what he saw was Tornit, which translates to Bigfoot. He remembered looking down at his gun and feeling like it would have had the same effect as a pea shooter. 
There was no denying that I was a closet Bigfoot enthusiast. My own experience at my home in northern Minnesota was what really fascinated me. I was in my teens and anxious to make a little money as my dad was semi-retired and had the idea to cut trees down on the property. I guess the proper term is selective logging since he planned to cut down those with the highest value. We lived off the beaten path in Beltrami County. It was quiet and when my dad said that there were kids partying in the woods, I wasn't sure I believed him. I didn't know of them. At times, he'd march outside, stare into the woods, looking for a campfire or something to help him find their location. He said he thought he could hear loud thumping noises, shouting, and trees falling. My dad liked to drink beer, and I thought just maybe the alcohol was talking. As the partiers got increasingly loud one night, he'd had enough. He woke me up, and we both stood in the pitch dark yard with our shotguns loaded, facing the woods. My dad says to me, watch this. All right, boys. I'm going to give you till the count of five to get out of my woods or there'll be hell to pay. One, two, three, four, five. Boom! My dad fires a shotgun off into the air and you can hear what sounds like the shuffling of feet and just plain scrambling about. I hear some muttering gibberish mixed together. It's loud. I can't tell what it is they're saying, but the voices eventually fade away as they seem to travel deeper into the woods. There, that ought to do it, he said. And just as we began to start for the house, up above us, you could hear a whooshing sound, almost like a helicopter making a whoop, whoop, whoop overhead, and then a heavy thud hitting the ground. We both jumped and gave out our own yell, as whatever it was must have landed within a few feet of us. What the hell was that? We scrambled to the front stairs and locked the door behind us. The next morning, my dad discovered a large broken limb laying in our front yard. No trees around anywhere. A few days later, as my dad was getting his logging plan into high gear, he came to get me and show what looked like a veritable fortress of tall, thick trees crisscrossed and left scattered across the forest floor. A few were propped up and almost looked like a giant Indian teepee. The down trees were probably 30 feet long and thick, maybe 10 to 12 inches in diameter. They must have weighed every bit of 500 pounds, maybe more. I know my dad and I couldn't budge him. I've walked every square inch of these woods. How? There weren't any storms or even any high winds to speak of. And look at the ends. Broken. After several hours, we were able to topple and then drag out the fallen trees with the tractor. My dad left me to cut up and stack the wood. Not long after starting the chainsaw, I began to feel uneasy, like someone was staring me down. I shut off the motor and removed my headphones. The only thing I could hear was a distant wood-on-wood -wood knocking sound, and then I went back to cutting. As I finished cutting up that last log, I could feel a deep rumble and then the blast of a horn. It was my dad driving towards me and waving his hands. I stood there, clueless, just staring at him, repeatedly blowing the horn at me. I made the gesture with my hands. What? I could see him shaking his fist and then pointing at me, but not at me. Something behind me. And as I turned around and faced the piles of cut wood, not 30 feet away, was something unusually wide, covered in cinnamon brown hair, and it bared its large yellow teeth at me. I yelled for my father, who was running up to meet me as I backpedaled away. It stood atop the woodpile, glaring down at us. In one of its giant hands, it held one of the logs I'd just cut, almost wielding it like a club. I'd removed my headphones and dropped the chainsaw to my side. It seemed to stare intently at my father and I, never once blinking or removing the scowl from its already hideous face. What is it? I don't know, but we should leave. We climbed onto the tractor and just sat there for a moment. 
We had a bit of a Mexican standoff happening until we saw movement on the woodpile behind the big one. There was another, smaller and identical in color. They both appeared to be male. They slowly disappeared back behind the woodpiles and hopefully, and probably, back to the woods. Of course, this was quite the topic of conversation between us for the next few days. I was close to my dad and confessed my guilty conscience thinking, do you think we somehow destroyed their home? Nonsense. How could we have known? But this is my land and I can do with it what I want. Let them go somewhere else, preferably far away. Do you know that the Finnermans lost livestock recently? I'll bet those oversized apes ate them. Dad, th those weren't apes. Those were Bigfoot. How do you know? I've watched a TV show about them and still have some old books on mythical animals. Well, it's not a myth anymore. Those things were as real as I'm looking at you right now. We kept this between us. It's possible that our neighbors experienced something, but they weren't talking either. It was only a few months later that I told my dad about wanting to head to the West Coast. There I'd spend time traveling and eventually make some contacts in the logging industry, and the rest is history. But now I'm back from my West Coast tour, as my dad is getting on in his years, and we're considering the future of his logging business and the property. So many years have passed, and some new neighbors have stopped by to introduce themselves. They've made comments about the noise at night. What noise? I asked. Oh, it's nothing really. Just sounds like people having a party out in my woods.